To you, they are part of your life. But to them, you are their whole life. And that is something that sits with me a lot when I think about dogs and just the relationship and living with a dog and having a dog. So on today's episode, that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about being the person that your dog deserves. Let's go over it next. All right, welcome to this week's Learn, Laugh, Bark podcast episode. I am your host, Jake, from OnDogTrainingAcademy.com. If you're watching us on YouTube, thank you. I appreciate it. If you want to like and subscribe to our channel, that would be awesome. We're small, but we're trying to grow and get a lot of knowledge out there. So you commenting on our our podcast or in YouTube, you liking, subscribing, this all helps get the word out, and we'd really appreciate it. If you're listening to us on uh, any other podcast uh, platform, thank you guys. We really appreciate it. And like I mentioned, I'm from OnDogTrainingAcademy.com, and there you can go on. We have some courses. We do one-on-one virtual training, um, and we also are doing uh, some webinars. We have a new webinar coming out soon that's going to be about socializing, and it's a live webinar where you can actually ask questions and stuff. So you can check all all that out on on OnDogTrainingAcademy.com. So, like I mentioned at the very beginning, um, the topic for today is going to be being the person that your dog deserves. This, to me, I think is so incredibly important. Um, Not only, I mean, it seems obvious, like, yeah, we want to be good to our dogs and all this stuff, but I just, when I deal with people... Uh, regularly, I'm finding areas that that they're kind of failing or or lacking in. And so I just kind of put a a short list together. And I just want you to kind of think about this stuff when it comes to to kind of being that person for your dog. You know, if you're listening to this, the chances are you absolutely love dogs like I do. Um, and, and, and maybe some of this won't be as much of a surprise. Um, but this is why we always tell you to share these episodes, because maybe this doesn't pertain to you, but maybe this can help somebody else out who maybe is getting a dog, thinking about getting a dog, has a dog, needs help, whatever. Um, So these are just a few things that I just jotted down that I want to have you guys consider. The first one is researching the breed before you get it. I think this is so important and it is so overlooked. It sounds easy, right? You're like, well, yeah, I'm going to research a breed I'm going to get. The problem that we see way too often is that People don't look at the breed as in, is this a good fit for me? They look in the breed and go, is this a dog I want? So you could say, well, I want a dog who's going to guard the house. Or I want a, uh, uh, I want a, a dog that's going to be a little more like lazy. Or I want to get a dog that's super friendly. You know, whatever. And, and those are all things that are fine. The problem is, is that when you're doing your research, you don't want to base it off of just one thing. You need to look at your lifestyle as a whole. What is your lifestyle like and how is that dog going to fit into it? I mean, yeah, we're going to mold our lifestyles to a degree to incorporate our dog. But at the same time, if you're living in an apartment and you're on like the eighth floor, the last thing you want to do is to go get like a St. Bernard or or this giant breed or even a a dog that's got high energy. I mean, you could even go even like labs or, or pointers or something like that that just require a ton of energy um, or exercise, you know, and it's going to be tougher living in an apartment, you know? So you want to do the research. You want to make sure, is this going to be the right fit? You also want to look at the trainability of these dogs. Yes. So I'll take our own dog. He's a Belgian Malinois. Awesome dog. Love him. Super, super smart. Now, would I, would I tell a first time dog owner to, to get this dog? No, no, I would make sure, you know, if, if someone was looking to get a Malinois, I would want to make sure that they're in a, a relatively active house where the dog is going to have plenty of work, have a job, or at least be able to be exercised, maybe walking, hiking, playing, whatever. Um, making sure that they're they're good trainers or good um, with rules, and we'll talk about all those other things in a little bit, but I just, you want to make sure it's the right fit. Don't get a dog because it's one you've dreamed about getting forever. Because that just might not be a good fit for you at the time. You know, look at what your situation is. Are you working a lot? Are you away a lot? You know, what's going on with all of that to help determine if this is even a good fit for you? 
The next one then is being able to afford your dog. This one is hugely important. You know, it's it's not just about buying a dog. You buy a dog, whatever, you pay whatever. And I don't care if you paid, if you got this dog for free or if you paid 50 bucks for it or if you paid $5,000 for it. To me, it doesn't matter. In the end, you need to be able to afford all of the other expenses that come with dog ownership. And I mean, the first one is obvious, like vetting. You, know, you have to you have to have, be able to afford to give your dog proper care from the vet. The last thing I want personally for my own dog is my own dog to be miserable, be in pain, and be whatever. So I do what I can to alleviate that. And if that means going to the vet and getting him checked out, yes, it's going to cost money. But I need to make sure I'm doing everything I can so that my dog is going to be feeling good. I don't want him to be uncomfortable or be in pain for any longer than he has to be. I, I don't call him fur babies. I don't like that term. But I will say that these these this like our dog, he is like a child to us. We love him dearly and seeing him suffer or be in pain is something I don't want to do. So we do everything we can to make sure he's properly vetted and healthy in that part in that part. Then you're also looking at like health, just health in general. So um, making sure they're eating a good food. Yes, you can go buy cheap dog food, and yes, it is an option. And yes, we've all been there to where you know what, we just can't afford the higher quality food. But there's so many foods out there that are good for the dogs that are are a little bit more expensive than like your your low like your your bottom brands, but they're still relatively affordable, and you can get them shipped to you now for free. Like that was something when when we first got into dog training, that wasn't even an option. So you have the ability to get quality food shipped to your house for like pretty decent prices. But just being able to afford giving them the good shoes, giving them uh, good food, making sure that they're healthy and growing and maturing and doing everything they need, you know, health wise. You know, we'll talk about uh, uh, exercise here in a little bit, but that's part of it too. Making sure they're staying at a good weight, not feeding them crap table scrap stuff and the dog getting unhealthily um, overweight, developing skin issues, ear issues, eye issues, whatever, you name it. So keeping them healthy. Um, you know, being able to afford training. This is another thing we're going to be talking about shortly, but being able to afford training. Uh, training's not cheap. I mean, I would say the average class, if you're going to take your dog into a class, which I obviously highly recommend, you can also, this is just a self a, a selfish plug here, but you can also check out ondogtrainingacademy.com for classes as well for, for like <clears throat> evergreen uh, courses that we offer. You can just go in and start running through uh, a couple courses that we have. Um, but training, I would actually say probably the average class is anywhere between 100 and $200 for a class. Some, some of them are even more. If you can send your dog away for a board and train, that's even more money. Um, <clears throat> so training is something you have to make sure you're budgeting for. You have grooming. If your dog requires extensive grooming where you actually have to send your dog somewhere to get groomed, that's always a big expense, and that adds up really quick. You know, So there's a lot of different things to consider, and I'm sure there's more that I haven't even talked about. <clears throat> you could talk about you could talk about like the training equipment you could talk about treats you could talk about dog beds kennels um, all of this different stuff everything adds up so making sure that you can financially support or afford this dog I think is extremely extremely important um, so really keep that in mind the next one then is rules I think when it comes to being a being the the person your dog deserves, I think just having a set of consistent, clear, fair rules and just being on, being on top of that and making sure, like I mentioned, you're consistent with it, I think it's so important. You know, I'm not going to say one day you can jump on me and the next day you can't and then the next day you can and then the next day you can't. Like If I'm wishy-washy with the rules, that is going to not only confuse my dog, it's going to affect our relationship, it's going to make things so foggy there or... or, or or just muddy that the dog just doesn't understand. And if a dog doesn't understand, then the dog can get stressed. And stress comes off in a lot of different ways. Some dogs shut down, some dogs amplify. And we just need to make sure that we are being fair and consistent with whatever rules you're going to put in place. And I'm not going to go over rules um, in depth in here, you know, but like manners, jumping, biting, um, you know, things like that. Those are, are certain rules. Listening to commands, I think, is a good rule. But if you're consistent with your rules and you say, here, dog, here's what I expect of you, and I'm going to stick with these rules, I'm not going to allow you to sometimes get away with it and other times not get away with it. I, I'm going to be fair, and this is what's going to happen. 
So that I think is is something to really keep in mind. The next one then is fair and consistent training. Training is is just as important in my opinion as rules because now you're saying here is how I expect you to act. Here's what I want you to do. You don't pull on leash, you don't bark, you don't lunge at other dogs. When I tell you to sit, you sit, down, you down, healing, stay, whatever. Adding these elements and come, recall, crazy important. But having training for your dogs. Now, I'm not going to get into methods of training. I sort of talked about that in a previous podcast. Um, But it just needs to be fair and consistent. You know, whatever training style you're doing, as long as the dog is learning and the dog seems to be happy with the way things are going, and as long as you're happy and you're able to implement, this is important to me. No matter what style of training that you're going to, if you're talking to a trainer and the trainer is saying train this way, that's cool. You can train whatever way your trainer wants you to train or whatever way you want to train as long as you can fairly and consistently implement it. If you can't, if you don't have the ability for good timing, if you don't have the ability to reward, if you don't have the ability to correct whatever it is you're doing, then you need to change or figure out a different way to train your dog. It has to be both good for you and your dog. But be fair and consistent with it. Your dogs definitely deserve that. Um, exercise, both mental and physical. So the mental side will come from training. you know. But don't just say, okay, I'm going to train with you uh, once a week when we go to class. Now, we're, we're going to work with you throughout the week now. We want to do training with your dog every day if you can. Um, but that's obvious. You know, Mental stuff, whatever. Physical exercise, though, that one to me is a little bit more... Um, a little bit more of a gray area. Because people will go, well, I walk my dog every day. And that's great. Walking your dog is great exercise. But I think it's actually better exercise for you than it is your dog. And I'll explain. When dogs are walking, they're using a select group of muscles. And they're just walking along, walking along, walking along, walking along. They might pant and get a little bit tired. But they're not really exerting a ton of energy. Say playing fetch. You throw a ball, your dog your dog quickly accelerates has to stop, grabs that ball, turns around, comes running back to you. They're engaging and and um, uh, they're enca- engaging and disengaging their uh, their muscles, and so that alone is going to ca- cause a lot more physical fatigue. It's like a jogger. If you just go jogging, you can pace yourself out and go for a long time, but if you sprint and then you stop and then you sprint and you stop, you're going to find yourself getting tired faster. I think it's the same for dogs. So although walks are good. And if it's what you can do, you do it. I would look at other ways. Playing tug of war, fetch, um, you know, daycare. Something like that that's going to get your dog, if your dog can handle daycare and stuff. Um, I'm not a huge fan of dog parks. Another whole other topic for another day. But finding ways for your dog to expel that energy more so than just walking your dog. Because, again, I think dogs can get on a good pace and they can go forever. And then, you know, I'll have people... Who And I just talked to someone yesterday, I think it was, who was like, yeah, I walk my dog, and when we come home, the dog seems more hyper than tired. Well, that's probably because it just doesn't really burn it off as well as, as you would think. Um, not saying don't walk your dog. I think it's super, it's super good for your dog to get out, see the world, and I think it's great. It's a great mental, probably more mental exercise than physical walking your dog. But so don't stop walking your dog. Just find other ways to also, you know, play with them, do fetch games, whatever, to get them to be a little more tired as well. The next one then is love and affection. So love and affection sounds simple, and it really is. But sometimes I feel like, and this will kind of go into the next thing I talk about. I feel like sometimes when we're mad at our dogs, we don't want to do it. And, and it's understandable, but we have to remember a lot of times our dog's failures fall back onto us. It was something that we either did or did not do that led to the dog doing what it did or did not do. You know, it, it's more of our fault. And so we can't, we can't get mad at the dog necessarily and then just completely shut the dog out of our life. It's just not how it works. I consider these dogs family and so just like a family, I forgive, I move on, and sp- giving that love and affection, I think, is super, super important. Yes, if they make mistakes, you can be angry. Yes, if they make mistakes, you can correct them or do whatever you need to do. However, in the end, when your dog is back to just being a dog, you need to be giving them that love and attention. That's bonding. Bonding, you could, you could train a dog and have this dog be an amazingly smart dog, knows everything in the books. 
We'll be right back. Hello, this is Panic. And this is Sarah. And, and you, you are, are listening, listening to Music Elixir, Elixir, a podcast between two friends discussing their favorite Asian artists and music. But without that bond, it's just not complete. Like, you might have this robotic dog who does things, but it's not really doing it for you. It's just doing it because it's what it's supposed to do. I want a dog who works for me because they want to work for me and uh, wants to hang out with me and wants to just lay down with me and wants me to pet them and, and play with them and just a dog that wants me to be in every part of their life. That's what your goal is. So love and affection goes a long way in that. The last one we're going to talk about, and this one I think is super important and this is something that i've seen a lot of owners um make a mistake on and that is you have to be in the mindset that you are in it for the long haul now this certainly could be uh, relationship advice for people as well because i've seen people guilty of this um but go into it saying go into it and, and in my opinion unless it's absolutely necessary And there are situations where you just cannot keep your dog anymore. It's not safe or healthy or whatever it might be. But for the most part, if your dog is failing in in, in certain areas, especially if it's training areas, that's more on you than it is the dog. And I always go into every dog, uh, every dog that I get that I'm in it for the long haul. I don't care if you, if you come out with certain behavior issues or whatever, I'm going to do everything I can. Now, obviously, if the dog's trying to attack you or do something like that, fine. There's, there's, there are special situations. But for the most part, I'm going to do everything I can to make sure this dog stays with me. I am in it for the long haul. I deal with a lot of people, uh, a lot of people, who, who contact us and they're like, if you can't make this work, we're going to get rid of the dog. We're going to rehome the dog. Um, and to me... To me, I've, I've always thought it's the same way. And again, I'm not, I don't want to get too deep into like relationship stuff because obviously I'm a freaking dog trainer. I'm not a, I'm not, I, I'm not, whatever. I'm married, but I'm, I mean, I'm not going to say I'm good at relationships, whatever. But I've always said that if you, if you threaten divorce, like if, if a person starts saying, well, you need to get better, I'm going to divorce you. The second you start using that word, it almost diminishes the relationship. Already that's an option. And so it diminishes the relationship. Now, people might comment on this and be like, you know what? That's totally not fair, whatever. Certain situations, divorce, fine, whatever. Okay, fine. Again, I'm a dog trainer. But I always feel like if someone gets to the mindset of, well, I might rehome you. If that is already a seed that's planted in your brain, it becomes hard to come back off of that. And it becomes hard for you to want to give it everything you have because that thought of rehoming or getting rid of the dog is already there. So I just go, you know what, you're not perfect, but we're going to work on making you better. And if that means I have to do something that makes me better, so be it. I'm talking about dogs, not people now. Um, So keep this in mind, like your mindset should be forever. Again, if situations come up, I understand life gets in the way and sometimes dogs have to be rehomed. But I also find sometimes when things get hard and think about, okay, we'll go back into relationships with people. You know, I've been married for... This podcast might get me in trouble if I don't if I don't actually remember. Um, I think I've been married 15 years. Oh Lord, I hope it's 15 going on 16. <sighs> hope she doesn't listen to this one. <laughs> Anyways, um, if you know, I've been married for for about 15 years. To say that it's always easy isn't true. But what we did is we stuck it. We're like we're in it for the long haul. So we're going to work through these bumps and we're going to get through stuff. And as we started to grow in our relationship, things got easier. We understood each other better. Our relationship matured, you know, we, and I think this is the same for dogs. You know, if a dog is, is struggling, we'll help them. Let's work on it. Let's be in it for the long haul, because I can almost promise you almost that if you stick with it, it will get better. Especially young dogs. This is really for young dogs because there's a lot of dogs that are between like that six months and 18 months, sometimes a little older or a little younger in there, that can be an absolute handful. And 
a lot of shelters fill up with dogs like that at that age because they're a little more difficult when things get hard people go well this isn't what i signed up for this isn't why i got it. i got a dog so i could have someone to hang with and walk with and do all this stuff and i i get it but at the same time those don't just go boof there they are they have to be worked for so you have to work for it you have to you have to go into it saying you know what we're going to work together and i'm going to have i'm going to help you become the most awesomest dog that ever could be and it's going to be great and it takes time sometimes to get there i had a basset hound you know copper he was a cool dog but and he lived to be almost 12 but uh the first two and a half years of his life we were button heads him and my wife were button heads i know i remember remember jenny was was at one point saying you know what if something happens to you i don't know if i can keep this dog because they just their relationship she would try and he was just stubborn and he would test her and and at that time she was still new to dogs and you know i just kept working him through stuff and eventually he hit about two and a half and it was all of a sudden that light bulb switched and he became that dog we wanted him to be he became that image he was a basset hound he became that image of what you would think a basset hound was before that he would test and he was a punk and everything like that i loved him but he definitely was a punk um but but it takes time so that, I think, is this last one. And this is a very long-winded last one. I understand that. But I think it's that important. Have the mindset of forever. Be in it for the long haul. This, this, just, just tell yourself, you know, I don't care what bumps in the road we're going to take. I like you, dog. You're a sweet dog or whatever. Or I see in you that you have really good potential. And I'm going to work to get that out. You know, like I said, super awesome good dogs aren't just born you know, we need to help mold and shape and create them. I look at Luda, our dog, and I can see, easily see. Now, I think Luda is the coolest dog. I'm biased, I know, but I think he is like the coolest dog. I love that dog. For He's like, the last dog I had, not Copper. Copper was my buddy. Cato, the Malinois we had before him, was like, he was like a kid to me. And when he died, he died really young of cancer at like four and a half. It was devastating, but, and I thought that was like my heart dog, but Luda has come in and he's six now, but Luda has become like our heart dog. He is just everything that, that we wanted him to be. He's a really good all around dog, but it didn't, he didn't come like that. He didn't come like that. We molded and shaped him. Yes. We researched the breeders and we did our due diligence and, and yes, you know, we did all that. But it was the training. I can see in him how with the wrong training, he could have been a complete asshole. I'll just say it. He could be a complete asshole. He could have been testy. He could have been he could have been a little sharp. But because of the training we did, we were able to create this dog that we just absolutely adore. And it takes time. And it takes work. But if you stick with it, it will be worth it. I promise you guys. So that is it for this week's episode. I really hope this was helpful. I really hope it it allows you to kind of sit down and think about your relationship with your dog and things you can do to make yourself better for your dog. Um, It's not always about like, well, my dog doesn't listen. Well, my dog pulls on leash. Well, my dog is barking. It's like, well, what can we do as people to make this better? What can I do to help him? I need to be there for my dog. I need to figure out what I need to do to make this situation better. He's not going to make it better on his own, he or she. Your dog's not going to make it better on their own. Just magically go, okay, I guess I'll stop barking at people. We need to be there and coach them and help them. So, like I mentioned, guys, um, if if you liked this episode, give it a like. Uh, If if you like listening to this stuff, make, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. Like I said, we're new. I think, honestly, we're at like nine subscribers right now. I'd sure love to be at 10. Let's hit those double digits and then let's hit triple digits and then build on and build on and build on. Let's get this thing going. Um, But thank you guys for listening this week. Thank you for listening on the podcast. Thank you for watching on YouTube, guys. And as always, we'll see you next week.